Hello and welcome to NewsClick. Today we have with us Professor Satyajit Rat, and we are going to discuss some of the issues which is relevant to the COVID-19 debate, particularly the role of Remdesivir, how well it's going to be able to be effective against the COVID-19 epidemic, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and the linking of the Wuhan laboratory and trying to cut funding, talking about how the bad virus was being funded by various agencies, including the National Institute of Health, and why this is a problem. Now, Satyajit, let's first discuss the Remdesivir issue. Interestingly, Dr. Fauci seems to be related to both the issues at the moment. Now, the Remdesivir trials have taken place, and uh, we don't really have what would be called the uh, double-blind trial results in a peer-reviewed form, even as a preprint. What we have is reporting of this using the White House actually to promote a particular trial. Now, while it may be that the trial was really useful and so on, and therefore this is justified, how do you feel as a scientist about a double-blind trial results being announced in this particular way, which seems to have influenced a huge uh, number of people in thinking this is a real treatment and that's what everybody should be using. Yes, and um, it, it's, it's disturbing um, in part because Anthony Fauci has so far been um, correct and uh, evidence-driven despite the precedent that he uh, serves. serves. Um, but for, uh, for him to announce the remdesivir results the way he did is disturbing because clinical trials should be formally reported in a full publication with all necessary uh, details that are looked at by people in the field. Um, at most, at the very least, as a... Um, Pre-print. None of this has been done. What has been done is an announcement from the uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Director from within the uh, NIH. That's formally Dr. Fauci's title. Um, has been for many decades now. And, and uh, that's unusual to say the least. Not only is it unusual, it's it leaves me a little puzzled uh, about why the hurry? Because despite the fact that it was presented as though remdesivir was efficacious, the data that were claimed in support of this efficacy are not startling or spectacular improvements. Um, Medically, we can call it modest improvement rather than re really a magic cure, so to say. Oh, it's certainly not a dramatic cure. Um, if I remember the numbers correctly, um, hospital uh, discharge median periods went down from 15 days to 11 days. Yeah. Um, in the first place, let us agree that this is not bad. It's useful. But in the second place, let us also agree that this is not a dramatic cure. In the third place also, let us remember that uh, the decline in mortality in this trial did not appear to be statistically reliable. It went down from some 11 odd percent to some 8 odd percent. And this was not as Fauci himself said, it was statistically not significant. Which reminded me of the paper that was published in The Lancet uh, just a few days ago. The Chinese paper. Uh, from uh, Chinese researchers who did a remdesivir trial, um, perhaps a somewhat smaller one, but uh, did a remdesivir trial and had data that are actually remarkably similar in their conclusion to the mortality data that, that, that uh, Anthony Fauci has 
reported, let us say. And that is that there is a trend to reduction that's not as yet statistically reliable. All of this put together makes me think two things. Number one, is remdesivir making a difference? Probably yes. A modest is, difference. Is remdesivir going to change qualitatively how seriously ill patients of COVID-19 are treated? I don't think that that's going to be the case. In other words, it's not a magic bullet cure. And if it's not a magic bullet cure, then this much of enthusiastic pre-publication publicity is a little difficult to understand. So one can think of all sorts of other reasons for doing this. One can, one can think of generous reasons, such as the fact that uh, um, this is a U.S. presidential administration that is not known for being science and evidence driven and is desperate for good news. And here is one piece of kind of sort of science and evidence driven um, good news. And therefore, it got pushed forward, let us say. One can also think, all said and done, this is Gilead uh, um, and uh, um, NIH collaboration driven outcomes. Then one can also be a little more cynical and uh, uh, think of this as a means of establishing Gilead's uh, credibility, shall we say. And global, global push for Gilead, therefore. So, uh, so one can think of all sorts of practical reasons why this was done. But let us be clear about this. Regardless of the absolute rights and wrongs step by step of how and why this was done, remdesivir is likely to be useful in modest fashion. So the two follow-up questions. One is a lot of the scientific community has said this is going to distort all other drug trials because people are going to say don't use us as guinea pigs, already established remdesivir works, give it to us. So in effect, you are also going to therefore distort all other drug trials. This is one issue that has been raised. And the second issue, which of course Didier Raoul has raised, who is the hydrochloroquine guy, if you will. He has said, why is it the clinical trials, what was originally set out as the criteria, the end point, and one of the criteria was reduction in mortality. Why was it taken out of criteria midway through the trials? It's as if you are changing the rules of the game midway when the game has already started. Yeah, so um, the, the first question that you raise, I'm not as seriously worried about, primarily because I think that everybody concerned even distally professionally with COVID-19 is going to look at the data of remdesivir and say, eh, it's useful, but we need more. Oh. So I'm, I, I, I would seriously doubt, I, I grant the point that you're making, but I seriously doubt that anybody is going to stop looking for drugs. And let me come back to that point about drugs, antiviral drugs, for COVID-19 in a while. Let me address your second point of the Didier Raoul's uh, criticism. Um, and to an extent, how shall I put this? It's a little bit um, a case of, um, as it's currently called, whataboutism. Um, uh, Professor Raoul has been um, accused of um, fiddling with his inclusion exclusion criteria in the hydroxychloroquine trial that he reported. And he's understandably, justifiably or not, but understandably upset about it. And um, therefore he now has a chance to indulge in what about this. Is he, is he reporting correctly that the um, uh, primary and secondary readouts were altered in the, in the trial? Yes. Um, is it that unknown? No. Um, 
many clinical trials do this. It all essentially boils down to egos clashing, to people getting upset, and to storms in a teacup. We keep coming back to the core point, which is remdesivir is not more than modestly effective, even if you take everything at face value. And really, from the public health and from the societal point of view, that's all we are interested in. Okay. We don't really care who's quarreling with whom and calling whom. You know, the only question is it, dressing it up a bit more attractively, of course, has an effect on Gilead's share price. Exactly. And that, of course, exactly. does make a difference. Which is why that's the second patients. issue I brought up. And yeah. I said, one is for the administration, for the current US administration to look good. The other is for Gilead to look good. And uh, both of those um, I have very serious reservations about as intentions. But from the broader point of view, I would say this is not a terribly effective drug. That is the central point that does emerge that it's a modest gain. And in fact, this, that is a question that you actually should be able to really throw some light on. Uh, Dr. Fauci also said, well, you know, when the AIDS drug started, they had also only modest benefits, but they have worked, okay? They have really changed dramatically. Correct. Do you see any parallel in that? So um, this now um, risks bringing my personal opinions and speculations in the biology of infectious disease um, into contention with people like Dr. Fauci, for example. Um, and I bring that up to underline the point that this is now a public airing of a civil disagreement. Um, okay. And our audience should, should take it as that. But that said, and those are caveats that I'm, I'm advancing. But that said, they point out two things. Number one, let me point out that the HIV infection that Dr. Fauci was alluding to, where antivirals over the course of about a decade from the late 80s to the mid 90s, came to protocols that really were effective treatments and I'm using the term effective very carefully. There are two issues there. The first one is that unlike COVID-19, AIDS is a chronic infection. Lifelong disease. It therefore does not either kill you or leave you cured in a matter of days and weeks. It goes on and on and on with the viruses ebbing and flowing and growing in your body if you're infected. It therefore gives you the operating space in which you can prevent the virus slowly, painstakingly, carefully, and hope over time to make a difference. That's the first point. This is not how SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 are facing us today. Severely ill patients of COVID-19 tend to die in days. Um, so a 30% reduction over 15 days is very different. Or a 30 days reduction, 30% 30 reduction every 15 days over a year. Which is what we are talking about. Which, is, say, which in a sense, is what we are talking about. There are, there are, there are more, um, even more striking differences because of these differences in the rates. Um, but yes, broadly, that's what we are talking about. Secondly, is. let me point out something. You, the HIV treatment doesn't cure you. Yes. Of it's lifelong treatment. Yes. What the treatment allows your, your, your physicians and you together to do is to keep the virus under control so that you can live a close to normal life. HIV cure is okay. still nowhere on the horizon in any practical sense. And this brings me to my second and broader point 
that most of my friends and colleagues think I'm being uh, a pessimist about, which is once a virus has established in the body and is growing, controlling virus growth is unlikely to have as dramatic an effect on improving illness as the same thing with bacterial infections and antibiotics. I've said this in some of our discussions in the past. Yes. See, bacteria grow by one, becoming two, becoming four, becoming eight, becoming 16. So you interfere and this is the rate of growth that you bring down. You never bring it down to zero, but you bring it down. Viruses don't go from one virus to two viruses to four to eight in their rate of growth. They go from one to a thousand to a million. Even when you bring this down with great efficiency, you're, you're interfering in an extraordinarily steep growth curve. Because effectively it takes over our cells to produce copies of the billions of copies of the virus. And therefore, I think that both biologically and empirically, effective antivirals will not be as dramatic game-changing treatments as effective antibiotics are for bacterial, for acute bacterial infections. But Coming back to Dr. Fauci, making this kind of claims, let me put it very crudely, is to put a bit of a lipstick on the pig. Well, to be fair if to I'm, him. If I'm being unkind, since I don't have to be civil, but it does seem to have dressed up the results a little more attractively than perhaps science warranted. To be fair to him, in his press conference, he did repeatedly say, that this was a pig. He just pointed out repeatedly also that it was a pretty good looking pig. Okay. <laughs> okay. Coming back to the second issue on which Dr. Dr. Fauci also is there. And this time I am going to ask you questions from his corner, so to say. Now, here is the attack on, that has come on National Institute of Health for having funded bat virus program and collaborating with the Wuhan Institute, Wuhan lab, uh, which was researching bad viruses. Now, the whole world on the issue of pandemics knows that bad viruses have caused repeated possibilities of pandemics. We have, for instance, the Zika virus, the Nipah virus, uh, the Ebola, all of this are there. So we have always looked on the bat as a reservoir of possible pandemic viruses. And with SARS, the earlier version, which is the SARS-CoV, um, effectively one, if you will, that virus also came from bats. So did the Mars virus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. So bats being researched would be the first line of defense world over. And collaboration would be something which is in the scientific community taken for granted. Why is it becoming so controversial? Is it that in the United States, the huge number of cases having failed to protect its population, now really looking for, uh, shall we say, uh, complete uh, bogus arguments and bogus uh, pointing of fingers? In some sense, China did it. It was uh, either China hid it or China did it. This seems to be the uh, new, shall we say, narrative coming out from the US. Absolutely. And uh, do I think that the NIH, the National Institutes of Health of the US were wrong in participating with a multi-institutional collaborative study with the Wuhan Institute of Virology for studying coronaviruses in bat? Not at all. The NIH funds has for decades funded these sorts of efforts. It's I think even in India, am I right? Yes. We have collaboration. Absolutely. With the, NIH, the, world over, the world over the NIH has funded this, not simply the NIH. A large number of, um, shall we say, prosperous economy funding agencies have funded, um, unexceptionably, multilateral, multinational collaborative efforts 
to understand zoonotic viruses. There's just no question that this was the right thing to do. It was right scientifically, it was right ethically. It was simply the obvious thing to do. So for the NIH to be forced as one gathers, what I, I don't know if this is a certainty as yet, but one gathers that the NIH is being or has been forced into canceling the funding that, or, or, or at least um, holding in abeyance the funding that involves the Wuhan Institute of Virology, is clearly, therefore, a purely political matter. Um, especially when you consider two things. Number one, is there any evidence whatsoever that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is anything but yet another natural animal to human zoonotic transmission of infection? No. All available evidence says that that's what SARS-CoV-2 is, that's what MERS was, that's what SARS-CoV-1 was, that's what Ebola was, that's what Marburg, Marburg fever was, that's I can go on and on and on naming zoonotic viral infections. They all came like that. This is yet another in a long list. And therefore, to hold the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which was working on the original SARS-CoV-1 virus, in common, let me point out, with a whole range of laboratories across the world, all of whom, including the Wuhan Institute of Virology, have been complaining and grumbling under their breath for the past decade that funding has been drying up and is being withdrawn because people have forgotten SARS and it, it's not been a problem. Only 8,000 people infected, so people didn't bother after that. And, and, and we haven't seen a case for uh, over a decade. So, so and, and, and this is the normal, everyday bread and butter stuff of life science and biomedical science research. So for, for, for the US, okay, let me be careful. For components in or elements of the US government to suggest repeatedly without providing evidence that this is an engineered virus or that this is a laboratory virus at the very least that escaped or was released is irresponsible and is clearly therefore Satyajit, when you say irresponsible, you're being very scientific. Absolutely. You're mildly. That's, that's why I needed to look for the appropriately balanced work. Um, and is clearly in pursuit of a political objective that's not supported by um, science and the evidence in the case. So in fact, it would also be that those who have been in the front line and the researcher in Wuhan She's known popularly as the bat woman who spent a very large part of her time in inaccessible places hunting for the virus as a protection for the people who could be exposed to pandemic. This is really trying to make scapegoat of people who are in the front line of science against such pandemics and researching on such pandemics. So this is really in some sense making somebody the victim for largely or essentially political ends, as you put it. Yes. Let, me, let, us, let us also point out, while we are uh, in, the, um, in the unfamiliar territory of defending my fellow scientists, um, let me also point out something else that biologists are being scapegoated for. You see, when there is an outbreak, of a new infection that is dangerous, at least for some people infected. By and large, the physicians and the biologists involved tend to be looked at suspiciously when they point it out first as, are you just trying to make yourself sound more important than you are? After all, your funding has been drying up, you've been complaining, we've heard that you've been complaining, now you are suddenly discovering that there is a SARS-CoV relative 
um, out there again. Um, how sure can we be that you're not making this up? Is what the bureaucracy of government the world over responds with? And it takes some time and accumulated evidence and many a miscommunication and misstep driven by this, 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 shall we say, mutual unhappiness that invariably and inevitably delays matters beyond what, in retrospect, we would have liked to see. Did this happen in this case? In all likelihood, it did, because it happens in every case. It has never, I think, not happened. Under those circumstances, I'm a little resentful that that inevitable likelihood of delay is now being used to beat up on biologists and physicians who've been trying their damnedest in China and elsewhere. Um, keep in mind that the Chinese uh, scientists working in this have been collaborating. The NIH grant is evidence of that with their colleagues the world over. And they put up the genomic sequence January 11th, January 12th. They announced it a couple of days earlier. And it's also interesting, once you shut down Wuhan, you sent a clear message that you think this is highly dangerous. So to see that after one and a half months, two months of that, people still thinking that it's a mild flu. Now that speaks volumes over the seriousness with which you took the message. Well, let me point out, there seems to be reason to believe that on the 3rd or the 4th of January, the Centers for Disease Control of the US were told by people in authority in China. Yeah, Dr. Gao, who China. heads the CDC China, and he was in tears when he was talking to Dr. Redford. This is reported by the New York Times. You know, was this a case of belated discovery when it should have been discovered in November, it should have been discovered in December? Eh, in hindsight, we can say many of these things. But let us point out also that country after country from the end of January onwards, told by the WHO, still did exactly the same thing. Delayed it, said, oh, it's not here. We haven't found any cases with the parenthesis that we haven't looked for any cases and therefore clearly we haven't found any cases. Every country did this in their own peculiar um, way of trying to minimize the upset, the damage, the turmoil in administration, in society that would inevitably result. We in India did something similar by not undertaking testing Absolutely. Still, on a wide enough uh, um, front early on. In fact, we just instead took the easy way out of not just imposing the lockdown, but imposing the lockdown and giving our people the impression that the lockdown itself would solve the problem which clearly at the moment it's not. Thank you, Satyajit, for being with us. Essentially, therefore, the accusations on the Wuhan lab is much more politically motivated and a gimmick to rescue President Trump's, shall we say, disastrous handling of the, of the epidemic in the United States. It's, it's, it's uh, five, one third, the, one fifth the population of China, and it's seeing figures which are many, many times more than that, both in terms of people infected and in terms of deaths. So of course he needs a narrative now. And so I guess does the United US media to admit that they no longer are the global's leading power being able to control everything, including themselves. Thank you very much, Sanjay, for being with us and hope that we can continue discussions in this vein again on the COVID-19, which doesn't seem to be going away. And next time we shall discuss Indian issue that you have raised, because that I think is also something we need to take stock of now. This is all the time we have for News Click today. Do keep watching News Click and do visit our website.